let's make which one is for reproducible. I think I've given too many talks this week. Okay, let's just copy that over. Put that in. And move it in. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's weird because I can click, but it doesn't want to click and move. <laughs> well, I mean, whatever. I'm also like the first one up. We can leave it there as far as I'm concerned. It's all the same. Let me just double click. Make sure it works. Yeah, it should be fine. Uh, so just a request before we get started, we're still missing slides for a few talks from uh, sessions six and seven. So if you have them, I, come on up. I don't have slides, but I have it on, on here. So my talk is here. Yours is online? Yeah, this is me. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so if you were waiting for me, I'm actually right there. Got it. Hopefully you can find that later. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that works. Yeah, just, yeah, just leave the tab open. Yeah. That works. Hi. Just one of the five minutes flash talks. Uh, yeah. And, uh, were you in workflows or community? Um, Probably. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, number one, 415. Yes. 415. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so then you can drag it there into the session seven. Fantastic. Um, can I just. Uh, yep, on that side. Is it communities? Yeah. It okay. <laughs> Great. Let's see. Mm, is it should pop up. Okay, maybe. Is it still reading? Uh, I think it's this one here. Okay. <coughs> I don't use a Mac. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Terrible. Okay, let me drag. Yeah, yeah that'll work. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. There's that. That's here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's community. Oh. Gosh. Bad. Macs are great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. That's why I don't have one. Well, anyway, it's because also they are so very expensive. Yeah. Oh, do you mind helping me out? Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Thank you. It's not working. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Oh, wow. Sorry. Ah, oh, there you go. Got it. Oh, yeah, All right, great. great. Thank you so much. Yep, no problem. Let me just get this out. Hello everyone, so I think we're uh, ready to start our next session. It will be on uh, workflows. Uh, it looks like we have three long talks followed by one, two, three short talks. Um, so the first speakers will get uh, 17 minutes to talk and then three minutes for questions. Oh, that's even better, it's way less painful. Okay, cool. See if this is still open. Okay. Ah, sweet presenter view, even nice. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Devin Ryan. I'm relatively local, so I'm from the Max Planck Institute, just a bit north of here in Germany. Um, so, I'm in a core facility. Um, and until recently, we had a little bit of a problem. And the problem was, this is sort of one of these things that are, is innately an issue uh, for probably all core facilities out there. Basically, we work in an academic environment with, say, 250 or so wet lab scientists. Um, this being academia, we always have new people coming in, and they all want to do sequencing, but they have no experience or very little experience. And of course, once we train them up on how to analyze their own data, uh, they graduate and they leave. And then the whole process starts over again and again and again and again. It never ends. But we're a core facility, so we'd really like to, you know, be able to handle this in some sort of coherent fashion, especially because they just constantly analyze or sequence more and more data. I mean, our capacity has probably increased tenfold in the four years that I've been in the Institute. So what can we do? I mean, really, we'd like to serve as sort of a knowledge repository. So after people go, we ingest their knowledge and sort of spread it out to all of our new people coming in and maybe formalize it in some way. So how, could we, how can we sort of enable all these new people coming in? Well, the easiest thing to do is to do nothing. So we just kind of let people do whatever they want. If they have questions, they can come to us. But otherwise, whatever. We just you know, sit around drinking coffee. The world and the cluster turns into chaos and fire around us. But whatever, we have our coffee, so we're cool with that. Um, that's a bad solution, of course. Um, it does, the directors of the institute aren't really happy with it. We could also, of course, just you know, write long documents about all the best practices, and everyone could simply read this, which they never do, which is really annoying. You should read documentation, of course. Um, you know, alternatively, we could always just analyze their data for them, because you know, we don't need to sleep or anything like that. And you know. We may have increased our sequencing capacity tenfold over the last few years, but we haven't increased our analytical sort of number of people that much. So that's kind of a no-go. Um, we could do things like Galaxy, which is wonderful, and we do do it. It's, it's great for some people. Uh, the reality, of course, is our sort of command, our real hardcore bioinfo folks don't really like using it, and they complain. They want to add a tool, and it's a pain, and I'm the only admin, and I don't want to, have, and IT won't let me give them root, and yada, yada, yada. So it's great for some things. It's not so great for other things. We need this high iteration of, you know, I want to try this tool, and that tool, and that tool, and that tool. It's not so great for that. And of course, we could simply just hold classes. 
uh, which we do do, but of course the long classes take forever, and you know, the, there's dropout in students over time, or we could have these huge, you know, uh, big intensive sessions of just spraying the with a fire hose of knowledge, and they tend to get overwhelmed by that, and it, the, yeah, the, they don't, yeah, it doesn't work well. They, you know, fetal position rocking or something at the end. So what do we really need? Well, we need some sort of pipelines that we can build over time as people come up with new best practices for whatever crazy kind of analyses that they're using. And of course, we need this to be, you know, reproducible, portable version, all the normal workflow stuff. But at the end of the day, these workflows aren't just for us bioinformaticians, they're also for our pure wet lab colleagues. Um, so th these need to be super duper simple to use. So these are people who don't really have command line fluency. Maybe they know CD and LS and maybe make dir, but that's about it. And that, and that should really be fine. They don't, and they really don't care about things like Docker or clusters. This, you know, stuff like things running on the cluster, it needs to work, but they need to not have to care about that. They need to not have to care about how the software is installed. It just needs to sort of work for them. Um, so they need, they need to be able to tweak the, very, the bare minimum number of options, and actually there should be few enough options that actually require tweaking that this can be fully automated. So it needs to be super simple, but at the same time it needs to not put us off as bioinformaticians. So we need to be able to also, we need to not have to tweak everything, but be able to tweak everything. And more so it needs to be flexible. So we need to have very simple, standardized, try it and it'll work sort of pipelines, but we also need to be able to swap in and out tools tools, disable things. If you want to use salmon instead of star, same pipeline, doesn't matter. You don't want to do some components, same pipeline, doesn't matter. Just one sort of simple interface. Um, but of course, we're not computer scientists, we're not programmers. We're at most formally trained bioinformaticians. Half of us, like me, are actually biologists who are just masquerading as bioinformaticians, which is a nice career option if you can do it. Um, so it needs to be maintainable by us. So, you know, we don't need some, you know, super C++ programmers to be able to maintain this stuff because, you know, that's not us. And we don't want to work, make some new workflow manager. What are, are there like 250 some odd of these right now? Like, we, the world doesn't need yet another one. Um, and of course we need it to scale. So we have a cluster, some people don't, they might have just a big machine. So sort of, you know, local cluster, maybe a cloud if they have some, you know, that sort of scale. I mean, basically we need to do everything for everyone without any of these drawbacks. And then I realized when I was putting this talk together that we actually don't have a word for that in English. So I'd like to introduce you to a very useful word from German. Because it really is true what they say on Twitter. There really is a long, this one actually isn't so long, German word for everything. This is the Eierlegende Wollmilchsau, which is an actual real German word as opposed to all the ones you see on Twitter that are usually made up. So this, this is a concept that, you know, it, it kind of sort of uh, um, nicely uh, classifies this sort of idea that we actually, and probably a lot of you use in your own open source projects. So what was our solution then? Well, we needed a pipeline, and so we came up with, with what we're calling snake pipes. Um, and we're in an epigenetics uh, heavily focused institute, so you'll see on here attack seek, chip seek, RNA seek, very epigenetics heavy things, because this is about 80% of what we do. So this is where we started. Um, but of course, these are our workflows, you could, they can be expanded upon. Um, so like I said, we do all the standard stuff, you know, RNA-seq, mapping, quantification, um, but we do a lot of other things too. So for example, for basically everything we do, we can do differential comparisons by default. Um, just providing a little a sample sheet of what samples are in what group, because all of our people want to do that, and we need to make it easy for them, and really, really easy, just not complicated at all. And a lot of our folks are interested in allele-specific expression, so expression from the mother's uh, lineage or simply the father's lineage. So all this needs to be built into basically all the pipelines and just have it all work out of the box, which is a simple option here or there. Um, so of course you need to implement, implement best practices, you know, with star, salmon, all that jazz. Uh, incorporation of blacklists for people who know what that is from the ENCODE consortium for chip seek and attack seek. Um, reasonable filters, you know, visualization tracks since people should always look at their data and we try to drive, dr really drive that home and drill that into their heads. 
Um, hopefully they learn that over time. And of course QC, because we're a core facility and we love QC. We QC all the things all the time. And basically, so we've built this into all of our pipelines. So you'll see, lot, see lots of QC everywhere doing all the things, because this is wonderful. This is what people actually need to know if their data is crap or not. I mean, you can get some p-values out, but if the underlying data is useless, then who cares, really? Um, so this is called snake pipes. So we, we made this, uh, you can find it on GitHub and documentation on read the docs. Um, and this is, should be really easy to install too because I'm n kind of lazy at heart and I don't really like spending a lot of time installing things. So we make it pr hopefully pretty easy. It's a one command line install via Conda. Um, a second one here, I don't know, there we go. There's a simple command built in, snakepipe create ems, that gets all the software you need from Conda. So BioConda and Conda Forge, basically, which is super convenient, no compiling things. And since we don't always have access to root permissions on things, we don't have Docker containers, and we don't really need the containerization that you would need on like a cloud since we're not using that. And of course then, also running things is very simple. You just need uh, basically to know what you're doing, RNA-seq, WGBS, chip-seq, what have you. But guess what? That's what the command's called. It's not some snake make with some cryptic thing to some file or, or module somewhere. No, just keep it simple. That way people can actually figure things out. Maybe an input directory of FASTQ files, somewhere to dump some output, and what genome you're mapping against. And that should probably cover 90% of your use cases. So as you can probably gather from the name, uh, snake pipes, we use snake make heavily for everything. So this is basically a, a fancy front end around snake make. Uh, why snake make? Well, it does a great job at what we need it to do. And one of the, one of the really nice things about it, sort of illustrated over here on the right, is that it, it's very highly modular. So obviously, it's often the case in sort of NGS analyses that you have various components that are common pretty much across all analyses you'll do, be doing, like trimming or a lot of quality control stuff. This is all really common. And we don't want to have to duplicate all the code everywhere. And really, SnakeMake has facilitated us doing that. So we'll simply have one snake file for trimming or for deep tools or for other things. And for whatever modules we, or workflows we need to use, they're simply imported in. So we don't have to redo everything. So then also the same versions and same options are used across workflows then, which allows for a lot of compatibility. Um, so yeah, we have SnakeMake, we have Conda environments. SnakeMake is also great. It makes things easy to send off to clusters or whatnot or to run things locally. And of course, we also want to keep things modular in terms of how users will be dealing with organisms. So things like um, genomes and whatnot, these are also coming from a simple YAML file, so a little text file. You can open it in Notepad on Windows if you're unfortunately a Windows user, that you can even do that. Um, I won't judge you too harshly, maybe a little. Um, yeah, so the, you know, these simple uh, sort of text files that are then reused again and again and again across everything, RNA-seq, bisulfide sequencing, everything. Um, and also, because most of our end users don't really know about how to run things on a cluster, which queue should we be sending things to? Do I need to run this locally? How should I be configuring all of this? They shouldn't really have to care about all of that stuff. So the general idea is that probably wherever people work, there's some bioinformatician who's pro or a sysadmin somewhere who's sort of the expert user and can simply edit a simple I don't know where the mouse cursor went, but the up there, cluster configuration file, and basically put all these rules in there and configure everything, and then everyone else, they don't have to care, it'll just work. Next slide, maybe, there we go. Um, and of course, because they we're using SnakeMake, as I said, it scales locally on a cluster. SnakeMake doesn't really care which cluster you're using. They'll pretty much all work. You might have to do a little fiddling here and there for something weird, but for the most part, things should be simple. I mean, this will be the same across all workflow managers. Um, and you, know, you can scale this out to hundreds of cores or thousands of cores or whatever you happen to have locally in terms of resources. If you have just a single server, that's fine too. We don't care. It's all good. Um, and you also get these nice DAGs here. So this is a, a, a plot of, for example, a very simple RNA-seq um, workflow. And the nice thing about this is you get these before you actually do the workflows. So you can just generate one of these and say, mm, 
Did I really want to do all of those things? Do I want to add other things, take things out? You can inspect what you're going to be doing beforehand, which is really nice. So you can sort of avoid wasting a huge amount of time on things. Um, and we have basically all the outputs in what we hope, at least, is a fairly coherent output structure. So usually things have outputs of the names of tools that are used to generate them. So if you have run an alignment with star, the output should be in something called star. The multi-QC output will always be in a folder called multi-QC because no pipeline is complete without multi-QC. Um, there are logs for everything. There's a YAML file that you can use because people forget over time what options did I use to create these things. And that's stored in that YAML file. And the beautiful thing is, if you want to apply those options to a different sort of data set, you can simply give it the YAML file. And you don't even have to remember what options you used. They're stored there, which is great. Um, yeah. Um, of course, we have all this sort of standard stuff, multi-QC, interactive reports. Yeah, that, you know, our markdown is great. Long, may it long live, or live long. Um, and the wonderful thing about all of this, really, of course, is you know we have all these visualization tracks, and they're all produced the same way, so they should be compatible with each other across um, workflows. And so we did a nice little test. We downloaded some data sets from this top paper here that was published in Cell a year or so ago. And they were doing some knocking down of various proteins and looking at reorganizations on the X chromosome. I won't go into the biology at all. And we were able, with just a few commands, to recapitulate the basic findings of their paper, with including H3K4 trimethylation changes in various regions and how that affects uh, or relates to DNA methylation changes, and even bringing in a public data sets because that's easy and everything's nicely compatible to show how these sort of changes uh, are related to open accessibility and methylation and things that the original paper didn't look, go into because they didn't have the data and they probably didn't know how. And like I said, this is so easy, it works with, without any intervention. So we do this fully automated these days. So we process thousands of samples every year with hundreds of projects, with a whole plethora of different sorts of groups and labs and doing different things on different organisms, basically without touching things at all, which is why we call some things like Big Red Button, because you know the common joke of we're just, we're bioinformaticians, we're just touching buttons, it's super easy. So of course we call things that. Um, yeah, so thanks to you guys for coming and paying attention. Uh, again, I said uh, you can find us on, on GitHub, uh, documentations on Read the Docs. Basically, everything else is on Conda. Uh, we're always looking for new pipelines and new PRs or bug reports. We're pretty much happy to work with anyone on this stuff if you find it useful. Um, and if you get no, nothing else out of this, I mean, what, what I'd kind of like to convey is that, you know, we as bio, bioinformaticians and analysts, we have our own workflows and we both mostly make them for us. But we can really come up with this stuff that not only we want to use, but also our end wet lab users want to use. And this is actually possible. We can make these sort of systems that give something for everyone and really don't put all of us off and make us run away screaming and say, oh, this is just for the wet lab people. We need something more powerful for us. No, you can have everything, you can have it all. You can have the Eier legend of Wollmilsau. Thanks. You can ask me questions on anything, too. So. That's right. So uh, <laughs> we haven't had any questions online yet. Uh, if anybody from the floor would like to ask a question, please head over to the microphone. You don't like I, me making fun of Windows people. Yeah. Awesome work. Uh, so uh, if uh, my, my question is regarding a new tool, so how, like, uh, how do you make this PR? Uh, how difficult is it to, let's say there's another module. Mm -hmm. Let's, what do we call like snake egg slug? Sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the different modules, right? So if I have a new slug, new module, which I want to add to this, so sure. how easy and uh, is it on the uh, online yet on the GitHub? Yeah, so every, I mean, everything we do is online okay. by default. There are no private repositories, nothing like that. No, mm -hmm. all open all the time, as I think most of our projects should be. So I mean, in terms of adding things, it, it depends on how really ambitious you are with your changing, if, with your changes. If you're just adding 
tools, that should be really easy. Okay. Um, you want to swap out something else, use something in place of it. That's just an if else. If you know Python you're good, and are vaguely familiar with SnakeMake, you're good to go. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and regularly, I find like this uh, once we get a one run of data, mm -hmm. and then we check the quality, and then, okay, we want more depth of the data, and we have another run, another run, and sure. then we have to do it. Yeah. So, is there, how do you suggest to do it? Is it uh, like can be done easily with this tool? Well, I mean, that, that one needs to take a bit of a step back and think about how you should actually be whether you should be integrating those or not, and that will depend on how the actual experiment was done. Um, I mean, it, in general, yeah, you can do that with, uh, this does facilitate some of that, especially in terms of like high C, where you off, we often also have this issue, and so you can give it a sample sheet, and it'll merge the replicates that you've done sort of across batches because you needed more depth. It'll handle that for you. The other module's not because usually we don't have those issues, like RNA-seq, chip-seq, usually those work. Uh, but we're doing a lot of samples, so that's probably why. Okay. Yeah. And another question, yeah. how is it uh, easy to install without disturbing the system admin or something? Yeah, well, so that's the beauty of Conda. Uh, you don't need root. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, any, so even when we're doing development, we're just, we have our Conda environment, we'll uh, Conda create something, snake pipes, and it's installed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. Yeah, you shouldn't need root for bioinformatics. Uh, yeah. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Hey, um, great talk, thank you. Um, I guess you have heard about Snake Make Workflows. Yeah, so Snake Make Workflows didn't exist when we started that's, this. Okay, that's why I, I mean, I honestly, expecting. if it did, you know, I mean, so our interface sort of front end might be a little yeah. easier, but we probably would have joined forces. I mean, it, you'll notice today there are a lot of talks, uh, NextFlow Core and things that pro from projects that originated around the same time. And so, you know, we had NextFlow and we had SnakeMake, we had Rufus, and then sort of we realized, okay, we need some extra workflows on top, and then we all sort of independently started things. Yeah. So you, that, that's why there's so many of us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.